that we would leave today different than when we came in. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation and for the firm rock that we can stand on, that you never waver, you never change. You're always the same. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Everybody good? Amen. Anybody happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Amen. God is good. All he the is. time. All the time. we got to work on that. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I think I messed that up. <laughs> we don't do liturgy well here at the Wood. <laughs> so my name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at the Way. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're in Matthew chapter 7 as we finish our sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we've been in the Sermon on the Mount for about nine months now, nine or ten months. And i got to tell you, I've been intensely edified. I hope you have as well. I thought that I knew the Sermon on the Mount well before spending nine or ten months in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited about the transition we're going to make today. I want to let you in on a deep spiritual truth today. A spiritual truth that will, that already colors every aspect of your faith walk. It's a spiritual truth you likely know. It's a spiritual truth you've heard before. And I'm praying today that the Holy Spirit will convince us that it is true. And it's going to be a real shocker for you. It's not all about you. You want it to be. How do I know that? Because nobody wants it to be more about themselves than me. But it's not all about us. It's not all about you. It's about Him. It's about Him. Let's get into the Word today of Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24, as we finish our sermon series in the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man... Who builds his house on the rock. And the rains fell. The floods came. And the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall. Because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine. And does not do them. Will be like a foolish man. Who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell. And the floods came. The winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. Words of Jesus. Interesting, he doesn't conclude the Sermon on the Mount with an invitation. Now, maybe it's just not recorded. I mean, he could have, but it's just not written down. But it's not in there. Anyway, so let's review how we got here. So if you recall, at the beginning of the year, we read Paul's letter, or John's letter, to the church at Ephesus, whereby Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, he says, you're doing all of these great and wonderful things. You're standing up against false teachings. You're standing for truth. You're doing good works. But I have this against you. You have forgotten your first love. Me. He says you've forgotten about me, Jesus. Your first love. And then he gives them two commands. He says you've got to remember and you've got to repent. You've got to remember where you have forgotten me and repent. And so for this entire year... We've been preaching and calling it first love. We've been remembering Jesus and repenting where we have forgotten. And we've forgotten. We need to repent. I forget about Jesus every single day. There's not a day go by where there's not a period of time during that day that I do not forget about my Lord and Savior. And so I need to live a continual life of repentance. We went to the place where Jesus tells us to go to learn about him, Moses and the prophets. We spent a couple of months in Moses and the prophets, uh, the law, where we saw who Jesus was. And then we transitioned to the Sermon on the Mount to see what Jesus says. And we've been in there for about nine months or so, talking about the things that Jesus says. If you remember right up front, Matthew 4, 17, Jesus begins his public ministry by proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is the message we've got to proclaim. This is a prescriptive message 
You want to be in the kingdom of heaven. You've got to repent of your sins. And put your faith in Christ. This is the message that Jesus proclaimed before the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is a window into the kingdom of heaven. What are people like in the kingdom of heaven? Why would I want to be in the kingdom of heaven? Why is this even a thing? And so right up front, Jesus defines for us our identity in Christ. We don't get to choose who we are. We don't get to pick our identity that I want to identify in this way or that way. No, Jesus tells us exactly who we are in him. He says you're poor in spirit. You're merciful. You're pure in heart. You hunger and thirst for righteousness in the Beatitudes. You're persecuted for righteousness sake. As a believer in the Lord Jesus. And because of who you are. Because of who you are in Christ. This is how you ought to conduct yourself. He defines the law for us. The Christian counterculture. The Christian ethic. This is the way a Christian ought to believe or behave. Based upon who he is. So I reject hatred. I don't even hate a man in my heart. I don't murder a man in my heart. I reject lust. I reserve all of my affections for my spouse. Or my future spouse. I reject worldly institutions. I love everyone. I don't care if they've done something to me. I don't retaliate. They ask me to carry something one mile. I carry it too. They want my coat. I give them my shirt too. I hate even, or I love even my enemies. I mean, even the pagans love those who love them. That's easy. The Christian counterculture, the Christian ethic defines for us a new level, a new way to live. When I practice my religion, I don't make a big deal out of it. I don't make a show of my religion. I give to the poor. I pray and I fast. I do all of these things. But I don't make a show out of them. I don't want people to, to look at me and say, why look at him? I want them to see Jesus. I don't worry about money. I don't store up treasure here on, he here on earth. I store up my treasures in heaven. That's how I view resources. I trust God that he will provide every single thing for me today to accomplish that which he has called me to accomplish today. And I pray to God to give me today my daily bread. I'm not judgmental against my fellow brother or sister in Christ. I don't have a judgmental attitude toward them. But at the same time, I love them enough to engage them that they might not live in the shadows, in the darkness, in sin. I engage them with, a, with an attitude of restoration, an attitude of gentleness, an attitude of love. This is the Christian ethic. This is what he defines for us. And he concludes the Sermon on the Mount with some very decisive words. He tells us there's two ways. There's the narrow gate. There's the broad gate. There's two ways. And there are people who will deliberately teach us things that are not true. And then we get to this section here where he gives us a metaphor. Let's look back to the text. There's two men. They're building a house. Now, what, how are they similar in that they are both hearing the Word of God? Both of these men are hearing the Word of God. What is different is that one is doing the Word of God. One is not doing the Word of God. The one who hears the Word of God and does it, he's building his house on the rock. The floods come or the rains come. You know the storm's going to come at some point in time. There's going to be flooding. There's going to be rain. There's going to be winds. But his house stands Firm because he's built it on the rock. Contrast it with the person who does not do the word of God. His house is built on the sand. And when the storm comes, you know the storm's going to come. When the storm comes, his house ceases to exist. It is destroyed by the storm. Let's talk about these two men for just a minute. Both of these men are church attenders. Both these men, they both hear the word of God. Can I press upon you that we've got to hear the word of God? You cannot possibly do the word of God if you do not hear the word of God. That would be an impossible thing to do. We've got to be frequent consumers of the word of God. Amen. Can I remind you that your faith journey began by hearing the word of God? 
Romans chapter 10 verse 14 tells us how then will they call on him and whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Your faith walk <laughs> began by hearing the word of God. Romans chapter 1 says that the power of God is the gospel for salvation for everyone who hears. What is the power of God for salvation? The gospel message, the spoken word of God. We've got to hear the word of God. But let me remind you, it's not all about you. You've heard the word of God. Maybe you've responded in faith. And been saved. Are you the person who is building your house upon the rock? Your neighbor is building their house upon the shifting sands. I'll just let them build their house on the shifting, shifting sands. My house is on the rock. My house is good. In the army we used to say, what? My tent's up. My tent's up. I'm good. My house is built upon the rock. No. No. We've got to proclaim we will never live a life so good, that so conforms to the Christian ethic, that somebody will look at us and be saved. No, we've got to proclaim along with Jesus, repent for the kingdom of heaven. That message has to come out of our mouth. Now, our lives will validate that message or invalidate it. But we've got to proclaim. We've got to open our mouths. We can't stand there and say, well, my house is built upon the rock. I'm good while my neighbor is building his house upon the shifting sands. We cannot do that. It's not all about us. We've got to hear the word of God. We've got to speak the word of God. We've got to preach the gospel to ourselves daily, weekly, hourly. I need to hear the gospel every day, multiple times a day. And I pray that every single time you are in our fellowship, you will hear the gospel message. And maybe you might say, well, why do we keep saying the same things over and over again? Because we forget. How quickly do we forget the gospel message and conduct ourselves as if we've never heard the gospel message? Maybe that never happens to you. It happens to me all the time. We've got to hear the word of God and that the word of God would inform how we live. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 tells us that all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you've been here for a minute or two, you've heard me tell you that God has called you to a specific work. God has a work for you that he has planned in eternity past. He put you here on this planet today for a very specific reason. And he has equipped you and given you every single thing you need to accomplish that which he has called you to do. He's given you time and he's given you the word of God. We've got to be frequent hearers of the word of God. I love Psalm 119, one of my favorite psalms, one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. It's all about the Word of God. How can a young man keep his way pure? I want to keep my way pure. I truly want to walk in holiness before God. How do I do that? By guarding it according to your Word. I guard it according to your Word. I love Psalm 119.11. Probably one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. He says, I have treasured your Word in my heart. I've stored up your Word in my heart. Why? That I may not sin against you. It is impossible to treasure the word of God in your heart. And to sin against God. Those are mutually exclusive ideas. Now again in a nanosecond. I can go from treasuring the word in my heart. To sinful thoughts. I mean it literally takes me a nanosecond. But as long as I am treasuring the word of God in my heart. I cannot sin against him. All from Psalm 119. There's so many good words in here about the word of God. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I like this one. When I think on my ways. When I think on my ways. And I compare my ways to his ways. And I see how deficient my ways are compared to his ways. I turn my feet to your testimonies. You want to follow God. You want to walk in obedience to God. Think on your ways. Think on his ways. 
See the deficiencies and walk in the ways of the Lord. Your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. Your testimonies are my heritage forever. They're the joy of my heart. I hate every false way, the psalmist says. I, I don't just know that they're false. I hate false ways. And my eyes shed streams of tears when people do not keep your word. It grieves my heart when people do not keep the word of God because I cherish the word of God that much. We got to hear the word of God. You cannot live a Christian life without a frequent, daily, repetitive consumption of the word of God. We're reading the Bible through again in a year. I got some brothers joining in with me. It's already the, what is it, the sixth? Fifth. Fifth? Fifth? Oh, I won't. You can start today. <laughs> if you didn't know that, right? I mean, just because if you haven't started yet, you can, you can start today. So again, last year I said I read through the Bible in a year with a couple of brothers. I've done it previously. Uh, and last year was one of the most blessed years of my life. Is that a coincidence? And I have vowed that that's just something I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I will never not read through the Bible in a year. Then some, perhaps, we'll see. You cannot live the Christian life without hearing the Word of God. You cannot do the Word of God without hearing the Word of God. So what's the difference between these two men is there's a translation that happens from their head. They hear the Word of God, their ears to the brain, to their hearts, and into their hands as they do the Word of God. They do the Word of God. The, the epitome of doing the Word of God. The epitome of doing the word of God, applying the commands of Jesus, loving God and loving others, loving God and loving others, because it's not all about you. Again, you want it to be about you. I want it to be about me. And we know that it's not about us. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would make us believe that today. We would leave here firmly convinced of that truth. Listen to me. The Bible the Bible is a dangerous book to read. Did you know that the Bible is a dangerous book to read? What's it dangerous to? You. Every single time I open scripture, every single time I open the word of God and consume it, I'm driving another nail into the coffin of myself. Every single time. Every single time. It is impossible to hear the word of God, to do the word of God, without denying self. And the more I hear the word of God, the more I do the word of God, the more I begin to reject worldly concepts of self. And these are concepts that are infused into our minds and our brains and our culture from our youngest days. So much so to the point where there are expressions of religion that support concepts of self that are unbiblical. Self-forgiveness. You will hear people talk about self-forgiveness. I've got to forgive myself. I find no mandate in scripture for me to withhold the authority from God for forgiveness and to forgive myself. Now I understand the sentiment, what people are saying when they say that. But that is not a biblical idea. This idea that I, God is the one who forgives. Who am I to try to withhold the authority to forgive from God? And so the more I do the, hear the word of God and do the word of God, the more I reject ideas of self, self-esteem. Again, there are, there are vast areas of Christianity where they, they, they use the Bible and our faith to build up our self-esteem. That is not a biblical concept. This idea that I have some sort of consideration of myself, the more I esteem Christ, the more I esteem God, the idea of esteeming myself becomes a foreign concept. Who do I esteem? I esteem Jesus. Jesus alone. He is the one who is worthy. There's all these other concepts of self that we reject. The more we hear the word of God and the more we do the word of God. Let's get back to these two men here. We got these two men. One of them is building their home upon the rock. The other one's building their home upon the sand. What is this rock? 
What is the rock? Let's talk about the rock. The more we say the word of God, the more we hear it, the more we do it, the more we obey it. Over time, we abide in the word of God, the stronger our foundation is. I love the interaction in Matthew chapter 16. Interesting, after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to, to actually do a lot of ministry. He begins to do the things that he's talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and, and if, you, if you read on from the Sermon on the Mount, and I pray that you will, we're getting there in our one-year Bible reading, but I'm going to keep plugging that. I'm going to keep plugging that. We get to a great interaction between Jesus and his disciples in Matthew 16. It says, when he came to the, the district of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus says to his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? Peter rises to the occasion and answers, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is not a good man. He's not a, a good teacher. He's not a moral man. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's so much more than we can ever understand him to be. And people today are so confused today about who Jesus is. And, and even Martha in, in John chapter 11, when Jesus comes to heal Lazarus, and he asked her, who do you say that I am? Or who do people say that I am? And, and Martha rises to the occasion and she says, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. He is a king like no other. He stands alone, unique in who he is. He is our rock. Jesus goes on to tell Peter in Matthew chapter 16. He tells him, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah. But I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Shall not prevail. People say, what are you doing to build the church? I'm not doing anything to build the church because it is Jesus who builds the church. It is Jesus who accomplishes this. And on this rock, Peter's not the rock. Some people, the, the Catholic church will trace the popes back to the lineage of Peter as that he's the first pope. Peter's not the rock. Peter's a man. Now he occupied the the office of apostle that has since been abolished. But he was a man just like you, just like me. The rock, the rock that Jesus is talking about is Peter's confession of faith. That you are the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. He is the rock. We sang about him just a little bit ago. He is the solid rock. He is a king like no other. So many people build their houses on, on shifting sand, looking for anywhere. To, everybody wants a, a solid house, right? Nobody wants to build their house knowing that it's going to collapse at some point in time. And so everybody's casting about, searching for a solid place, a solid foundation to build their house upon. And I think back to my own life before... I was a follower of Christ and where I built my house and what I sought to build my house upon. And even today, we see in the church, we see some mutations of the, of the true faith, of this true understanding of the gospel and who Jesus is. I've heard it called therapeutic moralistic deism. Therapeutic moralistic deism. It's deism because we believe that there's a God. It's therapeutic or it's moralistic because it teaches me right from wrong. And it's therapeutic because it makes me feel Feel good about myself. This is not the gospel. The gospel is that God saves sinners through Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We've got to get this right. We've got to understand this because this is the rock. It is the only rock. Everything else is shifting sand that will one day collapse and allow that house to fall. Go back to the words of Jesus. There are exactly two ways. There is Jesus and there is every other way. The way to Jesus is the way to life. 
Every other way is the way to destruction. This is what Jesus tells us. We've got to build our house upon this rock. He is a king like no other. And we see this throughout the Sermon on the Mount as he teaches with authority. I love the words that follow the conclusion of the Mount. Verse 28, it says, when Jesus, he finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished. They were astonished at the things that Jesus was saying. He was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. He is the Christ the son of the living God. He's not a good man, a great man, a moral teacher. He is the Christ. He taught with authority as the teacher. Not like the scribes who taught by authority. The scribes referenced the teachings of other rabbis, of Old Testament prophets. They taught by authority. Jesus did not even teach like the Old Testament prophets. Old Testament prophets would say, Thus saith the Lord. And by the way, if you hear anybody today say, thus saith the Lord, it ought to be followed very closely by a Bible verse. But the Old Testament prophet said, thus saith the Lord, but not Jesus. What did he say? You have heard that it was said, but I say, I say, I speak with the authority as the Son of God, as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we saw in the Sermon on the Mount, He said, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And the law and the prophets, every single jot, tittle, and iota of the law and the prophets, looked forward in anticipation to the Messiah who would save His people from their sins. And He says, I am the one. He taught us the authority of the Christ as Lord. He's not just a rabbi content to teach people, students who would sit at his feet. No, he received the title of Lord, expecting that we would follow and obey the things that he said. He was unique in this way. He was the Savior and the Judge. We see throughout the Sermon on the Mount that he is the one who decides. He is the one who directs. He is the one who saves. In the previous section, he is the Judge... He says, everyone will stand before me. He is the standard of judgment. Everyone who I do not know, depart from me. And he is the conclusion of judgment. Depart from him. He was unique in the way that he taught. He taught with authority as the son of God. My father, my father, my father, and as God incarnate. We see him reference himself in deity throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He is a king like no other. He is your rock upon which we will build our homes. And he calls us into a kingdom like no other. A kingdom like no other. I love the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to these wonderful words of Paul. He says, starting verse 19, So that you are no longer strangers and aliens. You were once strangers and aliens, but no longer. That's good news. But you are now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He is the rock. He is the cornerstone of the foundation of your life as a follower of the risen Lord Jesus. And I love the words in Hebrews chapter 12 where he's talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus proclaims. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, tell me about this kingdom. I'll tell you about this kingdom. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And then let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is an all-consuming fire. It's who He is. This kingdom is an unshakable kingdom. A kingdom like no other. It will endure forever. It will last. It spans borders and boundaries. It spans continents and countries and, and people groups and languages. It is a kingdom like no other, ruled by a king like no other. And this is the rock upon which we build our lives. Does that not give you some assurance? Wow. Let's get back to this text. One thing I want you to notice 
So there's two guys building their homes. Once these homes are built, they're indistinguishable. Typically speaking, you cannot just look at a house and tell what it's built upon. Or if it has a basement, if it has a foundation. You know, typically speaking, you cannot just tell that. So these houses are virtually indistinguishable. Can't tell them apart. What is it that reveals the foundation? The storm. You know, we spend our lives avoiding persecution, avoiding hardship, avoiding, you know, dreading the storm. But here we see the goodness in the storm and that the goodness reveals the foundation. Again, we don't go seeking persecution, seeking the storm. I mean, I don't, I don't sit there and pray to God, God, you know, send the storm, send the rain, send the flood. I want you to reveal my foundation. But it is the storm that reveals the foundation of our lives. I think of this friend I know. I had a conversation with a friend not too long ago. He is not of the Lord. He's not a follower of Jesus. Now, this guy, he's a, a young army officer. He's got a, a nice wife. Beautiful family, kids, got a great job, plenty of money, perfectly happy. And I was telling this man that he needs Jesus. And this man looks at his life and says, my life is wonderful. Why on earth would I need Jesus? I'm perfectly happy without him. He hasn't lived through the storm. The waves and the wind and the water have not come to wash away the sand that surrounds the house that he has built his life upon. But it's coming. That storm is coming. And so when the storm comes, where do you run? Maybe you're living in the storm right now. Maybe you're coming out of the storm. Maybe you're in the storm. The storm is going to come at some point in time. And what will you do? Will you be running around looking for a neighbor's house to take shelter in? Will you be looking for taking shelter in the trees or in the sand dunes? Or will you take shelter in your own home that is built upon the rock, the foundation that is our Lord Jesus? Where will your home be built when the storm comes? <laughs> it's not all about you. Again, our tendency is to take Scripture and make it all about us. So that's my tendency. That's your tendency. It's what we want to do. And so when I think about building a home, I'm thinking about being a disciple. But what good is a disciple who does not make disciples? What use is a disciple who keeps all of that to himself? Why do we build a home in the first place? I've never met anybody that built a home and said, I'm just building this home for myself. I'm just building this home that I can be safe and secure. I'm just building this home so I can have shelter from the elements. No. That's not why we build our homes. I love the words in Isaiah 54. There's some great words in Isaiah 54. Isaiah, talking to Israel, he compares the people of God to a tent. And then listen to what he says about this tent. He says, enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. He's comparing our faith to a tent. And what we've got to do is we've got to stretch out our tent, he says. We've got to lengthen our tent ropes. We've got to drive our stakes in deeply so that they can hold. And why do I do that? It's not so I can be more secure. It's so I can say, hey, come into my tent. Take shelter in the tent that is the Lord. It, it's, it's rough out there. There's a storm coming. There's water. There's wind. There's waves that are coming. Here, get inside of my tent. I've got to stretch my tent out so I can fit as many people as possible into my tent because thank God somebody loved me enough to do the same for me and, and, and when I'm building this tent I, I can build it on the sands and it's easy to drive a tent peg into sand correct? 
But what happens when there's just the slightest wind that comes? That tent peg is going to pull up. The tent is going to collapse. It's hard work to drive a tent peg into the rock. It's hard work. Maybe you need a, an extra hammer to more time. And it takes time to drive our tent pegs into the rock. But when the storms come, and they will, that tent will hold. And I don't build my house just for myself. I build my house for others. As I hear the word of God and I do the word of God, my house is upon a rock. But it's not a rock for me. It's not stable for me. Because I'm called to love God and to love others. And so when I hear the word of God and I do the word of God, husbands, future husbands, hear me now. When you love your wife as Christ loves the church, you are hearing and doing the word of God. And you are building your house upon a, a firm foundation that your wife and your family can dwell within safely and securely. When I build my home upon the rock, when I obey the words of God as I hear them, when I love, when I, when I abide in the word, I'm building a firm foundation, a firm home for my children that I make as disciples, as I'm called to do. Or even neighbors, someone else, anyone. Listen, as you're building your house, you have a decision to make. Where will you build your house? Will you build your house upon the rock that is the risen Lord Jesus as we hear the word of God and do the word of God, obey the word of God over time? This is what God calls us to do. So we've been hearing the word of God, the words of Jesus. And let me address another thing here as well. I've heard this recently as well, and I want to, I want to make sure that we address this I've heard recently a teacher teach that the words of Jesus in the Bible are somehow more inspired than the other words in the Bible. But I'm here to tell you that the words of Jesus recorded in Scripture are equally as inspired as the words of Paul, the words of Peter, the words of Micah, the words of Jonah. This is the word of God through and through. But we've been hearing the words specifically of Jesus for the last nine or ten months. We've got to get busy doing the word of God so we can build our house upon the rock. And so we're going to shift gears. We're going to shift the focus of our church to the foundations of our faith. We're going to spend the next up to a year going through Genesis. Starting with Genesis 1, chapter 1. And we're going to go through the book of Genesis. And we're going to see what the foundations of our faith look like. And I tell you, I couldn't be more excited. I couldn't be more, more excited to see what God is going to accomplish in this body of believers. As we examine the foundations of our faith in 2020. I'm just intensely excited about this series. So I'm going to pray here in just a minute. Miss Lydia, you guys can come and sing your closing songs. The great thing about scripture is it demands a response. Scripture demands that we respond. And we can respond in a couple of different ways. We can ignore what we've heard. We can say no. Or... We can say, yes, God, I hear what you are saying to me. Maybe your house is not built upon the rock. Maybe your house is not built. Maybe it's built upon the shifting sand. Here's the great thing. You can start digging a foundation today. You can start digging your foundation right now this morning. We don't have to wait. What are we waiting on? What are we waiting on? Let's get busy digging. And if you do not know the Lord Jesus, again, I don't want to presume, I don't want to pretend to know your heart, but I, I want to assure you that everything else is shifting sand. Let us build our homes today upon the solid rock. Lord, we love you and we praise you. I thank you for who you are and all that you have accomplished. God, I pray that you would work in the hearts of men this morning. God, I pray that even now you're convicting us of our sin. God, I pray that this would be a church that always builds our house upon the rock that is Jesus. God, I'm praying for 2020 that this would be a year of foundations. God, that we get back to basics, the basics of the faith. That we get about get busy loving one another and loving you.
God, I'm praying that you would work in a mighty way through the way. But right now, I'm praying for every single person within the sound of my voice. God, I pray that right now you're working upon our hearts. Maybe we've been building our homes upon the shifting sands. Maybe we've been relying upon our own strength, our own intelligence, our own whatever. God, maybe we've been relying upon religion. Some other expression. But right now, corporately, God, we proclaim you as the rock, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I'm praising you right now. God, for the, my own times where I'm tempted to build upon the shifting sands, forgive me. God, remind me that you are the rock right now. Remind me daily. Remind me frequently. And God, we thank you that you are the rock. We thank you that you're a king like no other who calls us into a kingdom like no other. And we just ask all of these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.